Dennis Corkery here, bringing you a Bible blessing. And today's study is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'd like to cover the entire chapter in our regular verse-by-verse -verse format. And it's amazing, we've already covered the entire five chapters in 1 Thessalonians going verse-by-verse. -verse. So if you'd like to refer to any of that content, I'll leave a link for you to, uh, in the description below. And if you'd like to follow along with me in this study as we cover the three chapters in this very interesting and important book, please subscribe now to Bible Blessings and hit the notification button. Now, as we come to this new book, 2 Thessalonians, I'd like to begin by giving you a very simple and brief outline. And there's three parts, three E's. And the first E corresponds with chapter 1, and it's encouragement in persecution. Then our second E, corresponding with chapter 2, is explanation in prophecy. And that's one of the important themes in this book, is a description and an analysis of end-time events. And then our third E is exhortation in practice, and that corresponds with chapter 3. So we have three chapters three E's, and I'll go over them just once more very quickly. Encouragement and persecution, explanation and prophecy, and exhortation in practice. Now, usually when I begin a new book study, I go in some detail into the background so we can get the context. And when we read a book or a letter in the New Testament in the proper context, it gives us a better appreciation for some of the details that we find in each chapter and in each section. But today, I think I'll just waive that because I did give quite a detailed explanation and a whole video actually on the introduction to this book, covering the background, how the Apostle Paul came to this city, how he was treated, I talked about the second missionary journey of Paul on which this church was founded. So rather than taking the time to go into all of those details over again, I'll just refer you to my exposition on 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the first video, I cover that information. So I'll also leave a link for that video in the description below. And if you need more information, you can send me a request in the comments and I'll help you as much as I can. Now, I'd like to just give a brief outline for this first chapter. And we have really three Ds. First of all, verses 1 and 2 is a greeting. I'm just going to skip over that very quickly because it's very similar to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and the greeting in that. And I covered that in some detail, as I've mentioned before, in that video on 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. But here are the three Ds that we're going to cover today. Verses 3 to 5 is, is the description, and it's a remarkable description, of the condition of the church in Thessalonica. Then our second D is in 6 to 10, deductions. Some of the deductions that Paul made, which are really encouragements concerning this church, helping them to cope with their present situation. And then in verses 11 and 12, we have a prayer. Our third D is dedication. Paul dedicates them to the Lord with a very brief, but a very remarkable prayer. Now, let me go over just very briefly these first two verses in chapter one, which is our greeting, or as some call it, a salutation. I'll read it for you. Paul, Salvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is very similar, almost identical to the greeting in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So I won't go over it in, in as much detail, but it's interesting to know these characters, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, and I give the description of who they are and how they came about to be Paul's associates etc etc in the video that i've already referenced and the letter is written to the church in Thessalon uh, the church of the thessalonians and he says in god the father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to draw your attention to this phrase, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's twice, once in verse 1 and then a second time in verse 2. And I want to draw your attention to that because it's important to notice that the early church from the earliest times believed in the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, some think that the doctrine of the Trinity was just a concoction of the Catholic Church that came several centuries after the founding of the early church. Well, that's not true. This is a very early document. This is one of the earliest letters written in the New Testament, maybe the third after Galatians and 1 Thessalonians. And in this letter, right at the very beginning, we see that the Father is called God and Jesus Christ is called Lord or Kyrios, which is Master. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul taught that there is one Lord. And that Lord is Jesus Christ. The word Lord is a title of deity. So we can see right here that there's equality with God in Jesus Christ. He's in no sense inferior to God the Father but he is a distinct person. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. But they form, in a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a perfect essence. There is not three gods, but one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God in three persons. And that's the mystery of the trinity. And it was taught by the Apostle Paul, by Timothy, by Silas, and it was understood and believed by the earliest Christians. So I just want to throw that out there because if there's a cult in your area that's going door to door trying to undermine the doctrine of the Trinity, you can see it right here if you look carefully. And it goes right back to the founding of the church. Now let's get into the body of teaching in this first chapter. And we come to the description that I've already highlighted or mentioned before in our outline for this chapter. So let's look at the description beginning in verse 3. Paul says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds towards one another. So the first thing I want you to notice here is that Paul says he was bound to thank God always for you, not just occasionally, but he had a continual feeling, an uninterrupted impulse to give thanks for this a remarkable church that had been planted in Thessalonica. And why was that so? Well, because Paul could not deny that God had done a wondrous work in the lives of these Christians in forming a body, a body of believers, a church, a called out group of saints. So he felt obligated to give thanks. He felt duty bound. And he acknowledged in so doing that it was a work of God. And this is why Paul says that he felt this duty because he calls them brothers. He acknowledged the genuineness of their faith, the genuineness of their conversion, and their genuineness of being truly part of the body of Christ. He calls them brethren and he said, it is fitting. In other words, it would be an outrage. It would be sinful. It would be a transgression if I fail to thank God for the work that he's done in your lives. And this is how he knew and how he describes them. He says, because your faith grows exceedingly, they were growing spiritually despite their difficult circumstances. And remember, when Paul planted the church here in Thessalonica, he was forced out of the city. There was an uproar in the city. And after a very short period of time, violence arose towards his preaching. And he was forced to flee along with Timothy and Silas. And these believers were left alone to face the music, to face their enemies, and they were forced to endure the crisis that they found themselves in. But despite that, they didn't turn bitter. They weren't resentful. They didn't hate their enemies. And they weren't discouraged. They weren't complaining. 
and they weren't considering giving up. So Paul recognized that that's an unusual thing. That's not something that's common in human behavior. He acknowledged that that was a definite and remarkable and undeniable work of the Holy Spirit. So he had a duty, he felt it fitting, to thank God always for these brothers and their remarkable growth in the Spirit. Now, I just want to contrast the testimony that Paul gives here of these saints, these persecuted saints, to Christianity in our present culture here in the West, in Canada, in the United States, and in Europe. For so long, we have not been persecuted. We've lived comfortably. I'm not saying in every case, but in most cases, I think that's a generally true statement. And yet, Christians in our society are not growing, generally speaking. Yes, there are pockets of growth. There are some places where there is a remarkable testimony for Christ. And that is to be uh, an item for thanksgiving and praise to God. But generally speaking, we are in a state of decline. Our faith is not growing. Our faith is not exemplary, but it's diminishing and declining. So we need to reverse that. And we can learn here from these saints who were persecuted and afflicted and under severe tribulations. There's no reason that we should not be growing. God has given us all the resources that we need. He's ready to open the storehouse of heaven to change our fortunes and to guide us on the path that he has for us. But that's a choice we'll have to make. Are we here in North America ready to change our ways? Are we ready to humble ourselves? And instead of entrusting in ourselves and in, in the world around us and compromising with the culture, are we ready to make a strong break? with a compromising culture and to move ahead and to forge ahead in the path that God has called us to. So they were growing in their faith. That was a, a description that fitted them very well. And Paul goes on to say not only that were they growing, but he says, and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. They were not only a growing church, they were a loving church. Again, they had every reason to grow bitter, to grow discouraged, to complain, to hate their enemies, to blame others for their problems. It wasn't easy for them to love and to care for one another. Or we might think of it this way. They might have just said, well, every man for himself, I'll just work to preserve myself and my family and let others fend for themselves. But that's not how Paul describes them here. He says their love abounded towards each other. They cared for each other. They made sacrifices and supported and prayed and cared for one another in a very practical way. And again, a lesson for us here too. Are we caring for the saints around us? Are we characterized as believers, as being loving? Or are we selfish? Or are we bitter? Or are we pride? prideful and indifferent towards others. So we can learn from these Christians that the way that God commends is the way of love. And there's no excuse. We can always make excuses why we fall short or why we're neglecting the things God has called us to do. But we must always remember there is no excuse. And here is an example. A church that if there were excuses to be made, they had every excuse to make them. But they didn't. Instead, they did what God required of them. They loved one another as the Lord himself had taught. And so they obeyed and reaped the rewards for their obedience. And I just want to quote another verse here that I think that's very important. 1 John 2.10, it says, He who loves his brother abides in the light. This is one of the keys to growing spiritually and to abiding in Christ is that we love our brother. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause of stumbling in him. This is how we walk in the light. If we love others, it takes out the stumbling stones. That's all really God requires of us, to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. If we do that, 
John says, we will not stumble. So that was the description, another descriptor of this blessed church. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 4, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you, uh, that you endure. So they were not only a growing church spiritually, they were not only a loving church, but here we learn that they were an enduring church. They were persecuted. They had fierce enemies, violent enemies. They were suffering tribulation. They may have been displaced from their homes. They may have been separated from their families. They may have been cast out of their place of employment. Their income may have been disrupted but they endured it. They weren't complaining. They weren't thinking of giving up. They weren't shaking their fist at God and blaming him, but they were patiently and in faith enduring that. And I think that there's a lesson here again for us in North America, in Canada, in the West in general, the church in the last century has really not known much persecution. It hasn't been a common thing. I'm not saying that there haven't been places where and instances where Christians have been persecuted, but generally speaking, it's not been our experience. But I want to read to you what Jesus said, because I think it's important that, especially in the time that we're living in now, that we should be prepared for persecution. Let me read the verses for you. This is what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So when Jesus says this, he's saying, if the world hates you, don't be surprised. Don't let it be something that startles you or disrupts your walk with God because they hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love his own. That's why they don't love you because you're not of them, unless you're compromising with them and joining them. But if you were of the world, the world would love his own. Yet, because you are not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. It's not you that, it hate, uh, that they hate, it's Christ that they hate, and because he's called you out to follow him, they despise that. And then he says, remember the word that I said unto you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Now I live in Canada and sad to say, one of the things Canada is becoming known for is persecuting pastors. There's been several um, instances and these stories have gone all around the world where under these COVID restrictions and mandates, churches have been unable to meet for worship. And when they are able to meet, it's only in very small numbers. And the state or the government is dictating how we conduct our worship. That's not right. So certain pastors have taken a stand and they've been persecuted. They've been arrested, treated roughly, thrown in jail, and threatened with further disruptions and persecutions unless they give up biblical Christian worship. I think it's fair to say that. So I think Christians need to be ready for persecution. These Christians were. What are we going to do if we have to face more intense persecutions than we're used to? Are we going to deny the Lord? Are we going to deny the faith? Are we going to compromise with the world and follow their dictates? Well, these Christians didn't. And Paul boasted of them because of their remarkable stance. In the face of these persecutions, they were growing, they were loving, they were abounding, and they were enduring it all. So there's no reason for us not to be ready. There's no reason for us not to be able to persevere. God has given us every resource that we need to cope with every trial. And if these trials do come upon us, we must, we must remember 
that it's an opportunity to serve the Lord, even though it's difficult. We have to remember that we have been called upon to bear the cross of Christ and to follow him, even though we may be called upon to suffer persecution for his namesake. Now we come to our second part in our outline here in chapter one, and that is deductions. And these deductions are really encouragements. And I wanna draw a contrast here in these deductions. There's things that we can deduce, or Paul deduced, considering the future rewards of the saints or the church. And I've got three here that I wanna highlight. And then there are certain deductions that we can make concerning their adversaries and those who are troubling them. And on the one side, they're very good and blessed. And on the other side, they're very terrible and horrific. And in fact, when I think about it, there's nothing worse than that we can, there's nothing worse we can possibly conceive of than the trouble that's coming for those who oppose these Christians. So let's look at verse 5. And it says in verse 5, which is a manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. So there's a deduction. They were a worthy church. They would be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which they suffered. Now this is an encouragement, isn't it? We ask the question, how were they able to endure such persecutions and afflictions? How were they able to endure such troubles? Well, they looked forward. That was part of their faith that was growing. They believed in the promises of God. They believed in the promise of rewards for those who were faithful and endured. So they took them to heart. And Paul commends them here and encourages them and says that you are worthy or you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. And at the first part of the verse, he says that it is, a right, it is the righteous judgment of God. In other words, God will deal with you justly. Your suffering is temporary. It's intense, it's difficult, but remember, it's temporary. And your rewards, by contrast, will be eternal. So that, those are the deductions that we can make here. And so it's important for us too especially in the present circumstances that we're living in here in North America. I live in Canada. And one of the things that Canada is becoming known for, sad to say, is persecuting Christians. The government is setting the terms for Christian worship now under COVID-19 restrictions. And some pastors have taken issue with this. Their consciences and really the word of God are informing them that they have an obligation to God to conduct worship according to his word. And I agree with that. And the government is taking the unprecedented step of interfering with Christian worship. And so many of these pastors now have been arrested, thrown in jail, and threatened with further persecutions or prosecutions. Same thing, I guess. So what are they to do? Well, many of them are taking a stand now, not all. Actually, those who are taking a stand are in the minority by far, but they are to be commended. They will be rewarded. And God takes note of their faithfulness. And I just want to remind you and really remind myself here as we're discussing that today, persecution is something that we have not been really exposed to here in North America only in a limited way. But didn't Jesus warn his disciples and prepare them for the prospect of being persecuted and hated and even murdered? Yes, he did. And it's found in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 20. And I'll read to you what Jesus told his disciples just before he departed uh, from them to go to the cross. And he said this, he said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. 
Remember the word that I said unto you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Jesus was ready now to go to the cross. He was giving that discourse in the upper room. And he was teaching his disciples to be prepared. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Be ready. And I think now there's been a change. Christianity was tolerated in our society up until now, but those conditions probably will not prevail. And I believe it's already started. So how are we going to react to it? Well, I hope that we'll be like the church in Thessalonica. I hope that we'll be ready to endure. I hope that we'll take to heart that God has promised to count us worthy of the kingdom of God if we suffer for his sake. Now, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about rewards in the future kingdom. We will receive rewards at the judgment seat of Christ for our faithfulness and for our, be our obedience to Christ. And that's what Paul is referring to here. So that's one of the deductions he makes. Now the second deduction is in verse 6. And this is what he says. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The second thing that we can deduce, the second deduction, is that the saints will have a rest. Yes, we'll have trials in this world. Yes, we'll have troubles. Yes, we'll have antagonism. Yes, we'll feel overwhelmed and alone at times, but there's coming a future rest. There's a millennial kingdom coming. There's a rapture where we will be caught up. We will be spared from the wrath in the tribulation. We will return with Christ when he's revealed, as is mentioned here, with his holy angels. And we will rest when Jesus is revealed from heaven. We will have our part in that millennial kingdom and also in the future state. So that strengthens our faith. We remember as Hebrews chapter 4 teaches, I'll read the verse here. It says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. It's a future rest. We rest in Christ now, but we will rest more completely in those future events in the millennial kingdom and in the eternal state. So that's one of the deductions here that we can draw for those who are faithful in Christ as this church was. And let's jump down now to verse 10 as we're making this contrast. And in verse 10, it says, when he comes, referring to Jesus Christ, in that day, the day of the Lord, to be glorified in his saints. Isn't that marvelous? He will be glorified in us. At the rapture, the church will be changed in the moment and in the twinkling of an eye. We'll be caught up. These mortal bodies will be transformed. They'll be changed. We'll be in our heavenly mansions, as they're described in John chapter 14, with Jesus throughout that seven-year tribulation period where the wrath of God is poured out on the world. And then we will return in glorified bodies to rule and reign with Christ. That is the blessed hope of the church. And Paul reminds them of that. Again, it encourages them to persist and persevere in their faith, even though they are persecuted and even though it's painful and difficult at times. So he will be glorified in his saints and Jesus will be admired among those who believe because our testimony among you was believe so they will be rewarded now there's a contrast to be made i made the point that the saints will be counted worthy of the kingdom of god they will have rest they will be glorified these are all future blessings and rewards for faithfulness but now let's contrast this with the with the wicked let's draw the proper deductions let's look at verse six since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Those who are doing the troubling are contrasted with the saints that are enduring persecution. And what is the lot or the deduction that we can draw here? Well, 
those who trouble the saints, those who don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, those who hate the gospel, they may feel quite secure and confident that they will never be held accountable for their actions. But that's not the deduction that we should draw. No. It is a righteous thing with God. God will bring righteous judgment upon evildoers. And what will that righteous judgment be? Well, he will bring tribulation. Tribulation. And that tribulation that he was referring to here, he might have been referring to the Great Tribulation. Of course, they didn't know exactly when that day would come. And that's true even now. Those who trouble us or who trouble you, who have troubled the church and reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, they may very well be thrown into the horrors of this coming Great Tribulation period. And it's a period of unprecedented tribulation. We can point to times in history of great calamity, great catastrophic events, great and mounting death tolls in wars and famines and in other world events. But this coming tribulation is unprecedented. There's never been a time of trouble in past history that compares with this time that the Bible speaks about, and that is the Great Tribulation. But whether this is that period or not, there is also, as we will find out, a time of eternal punishment. So let's go on making this contrast. And when we look in verse 8, it says here, when Jesus comes, he says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not God. He will come with his mighty angels. He will be revealed Every eye shall see him. That's Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. He'll come in flaming fire with his mighty angels, and he will take vengeance. They will be repaid for their evil deeds. Now, this is something that the wicked don't expect. They expect that they'll prevail in their wickedness. And I think about that, especially in the time that we're living in now. There's forces in our world that are bent on wickedness. They're bent on the most vile evils. And yet they believe, they truly believe, they'll never be held accountable. If they were to only consider the horrors that God will mete out to them, it may be even begin in this world, but definitely in the world to come, I think it would give them pause. But they reject all warnings. They harden their hearts like Pharaoh, and it is impossible to correct them. But we as Christians can take heart knowing that there is a day of vengeance coming, and it's described in great detail in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, especially chapters 17 and 18, but even further on when we read about how the beast and the false prophet will be cast alive into the lake of fire. And we read of the great white throne judgment in the book of Revelation, when all will be standing before God. The books will be opened and everyone will be judged according to their deeds. So the wicked don't really think about that. But there is a day of vengeance coming. And in verse 9, again, another deduction to be made. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now there's two things to notice here. They will never be again in the presence of the Lord. They will be cast, Jesus described it, into outer darkness where there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now some cults try to soften these verses and say that there is no eternal destruction or eternal punishment. Is this true? Well, I think that the verse bears out that this is false. This is a false hope that people are trying to hang on to. And in verse 9, it says that they will be punished with what? Annihilation? No. Extingu uh, being extinguished somehow? No. No but they will be punished with everlasting destruction. 
from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They will be separated from God eternally. Now, what does that mean? Isn't it true that God is present in all places? Isn't omnipresent one of God's attributes? Weren't we taught that as kids? And isn't that still true? So how do we reconcile this? They'll be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. They'll be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing. Well, I think it means from the presence of God's blessedness. In this world, Jesus said that God allows the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. Even the unjust experience grace and goodness from God. They're not saved. They're not destined for heaven. They don't have everlasting life. They're still objects of his wrath, but in a sense, they still receive many common blessings. They have families that they enjoy. They have work that they can prosper in. They enjoy all the benefits and blessings that accompany living in this world. He causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So in this world, we do still receive whether we're saved or unsaved, we do still receive God's blessings in one form or another. But in this punishment that's described here as everlasting destruction, there will be absolutely no blessing. It will be continuous weeping, continuous wailing, and continuous gnashing of teeth. And there will never be any relief from it. Now, in this world, when we suffer and have trials, there's various ways that we can find relief. We can find relief by talking to a friend. We can find relief in medication. We can find relief in one way or another to ease our pains and to ease our sorrows. But here there will be no relief. There will be no rescue. There will be no time limit. In other words, when a person is thrown in jail, he says, well, I guess I'll have to do my time. And that kind of strengthens his heart because he knows that there's a time coming when he'll be released and his sentence will expire. This sentence of eternal destruction will never expire. It is perpetual and everlasting. And having said all that, it seems very terrible, doesn't it? But I want to encourage you that if you're not saved already and these words seem frightening to you, you can be saved even now. And it's very simple. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't think that needs very much convincing, at least in most cases. Most people know and acknowledge that they sinned. And some even feel very intensely the burden of their sin. So God has given us a remedy for sin, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. And the wonder of the cross is that Christ took our punishment for us. When we look at the cross, when I look at the cross, I see the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And when I see the blood flowing from his side, from his brow, from his hands, and from his feet. I realize that that blood is my redemption, in that Jesus paid the penalty for my sins in my place. He paid that debt for me. Now I have no debt to divine justice, because Christ paid on my behalf. And if you will believe that, that Christ suffered the just for the unjust, that he died to pay a ransom for your sins. If you will trust him as your savior and believe in him, then you will be saved from the wrath which is to come. And John 3.16 confirms that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
So there's quite a contrast here. Let me go over it again. The saints will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which they suffer. On the other hand, the ungodly, those who persecute the church of Jesus Christ and antagonize those who believe in the Lord, they will receive repayment for their deeds with tribulation, great tribulation. I can't predict exactly when that will happen, but that should be the expectation of the wicked. There will be a time of retribution and punishment that you will not be able to escape. Then, the second point, there will be rest for the children of God. You may feel very unsettled in this world. Your very existence may seem in jeopardy and uncertain, but there is a coming rest according to the promise of God. And you, child of God, can be assured that that rest is coming, that it will be wonderful and satisfying and uninterrupted and eternal in the millennial kingdom and also in the eternal state. And by contrast, the wicked should expect vengeance in flaming fire. When Jesus comes, he will take vengeance on those who obey not God. And that means simply that they have not obeyed the gospel call to believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the final point of comparison, those who believe in Jesus Christ will be glorified, eternal glory. Those he justified, he also glorified. And that's a future hope that we as Christians have. By contrast, there is punishment coming for the wicked. Eternal destruction and eternal separation from God in the place that the Bible calls a flaming inferno and a lake of fire. And these are very serious issues, very serious deductions that we have to come to terms with. Now, for the sake of time, I'm just going to cut the message short today. I was going to cover these last couple of verses, 11 and 12, but I think I'll leave that for our next video. So this is Dennis Corkery with Bible Blessings. Thank you for joining.